Hello again and welcome to this episode of What's Up Prof. Hi Martin, we're continuing our saga. Yeah, well, I hope the people found the previous one interesting and it was set out quite straightforward. It wasn't clouded with all sorts of... I hope of it's not complicated and that we can make the complex one um, filled with less cobwebs. That's it. Maybe we can just give a brief summary of what we've discussed and just to get the intro into this and then we can pray. Well, we were talking about this woman that rides the beast mm -hmm. and we saw that she rides it continuously throughout all its stages. Yeah. But there is, a, is not stage mm -hmm. when she has no power, when her secular crown power is taken away. But she's, but she's still riding the exactly. beast. So what is she riding and who's doing her bidding? It must be a proxy. And that came out of the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. Now, the only other information we have about where, where a philosophy comes out of the bottomless pit is in Revelation chapter 11, when France went directly against the scriptures. It did all the things that were necessary, opposed that through Napoleon. It legalized all religions, put them on the same footing, no discrimination anymore. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there was a massive drive to discredit the scriptures. That's it. And you had the rise of uh, the higher critical movements. Yeah. Reason. And you had the age of reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, all those Jesuitical philosophers like Vol Voltaire and all of them were instrumental in making the Bible a book of myths. Yeah discrediting it, making it seem disjointed, when we can see this magnificent harmony that the reformers had discovered, yeah. but which had to be buried under a pile of rubbish yeah. and through Jesuitical theories and diabolical, abominable uh, doctrines, they had destroyed yeah, and took, the whole thinking of the Reformation. And took the heat away from the true yes. identity of the woman and the beast. And instead of going with the biblical flow from literal Israel to spiritual Israel, they reintroduced literal Israel and changed the entire religious thinking of the Protestant world. It is a horrendous situation and may God give us wisdom to determine this travesty of justice. Amen. And may we try and put it back to where it should, the focus should be. Let's put it back. So let's pray before we start with this one. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can have an opportunity to do this discussion. We need such clarity that only you can give. So please enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit and also the viewers. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So five had fallen. One is... And nobody knows that she's ruling because she doesn't have any crowns. Mm. She's from the bottomless pit, so the philosophy that she is propagating is a bottomless pit philosophy, uh, dressed up like a lamb-like philosophy. Yeah. It's a very sad state of affairs. So what we have in the sixth beast mm. is a situation where... Uh, there are philosophies that are talking against each other. Mm -hmm. Because the dragon philosophy is the church rules and her dogmas stand. The other philosophy is the church is totally removed from government and has no say whatsoever. Yep. And in any case, if you want to base it on the Bible, the Bible is a discredited book. Correct. Nobody and believes Genesis. They made sure in 1844... Mm -hmm that the theory of evolution took care of that, then the higher critics took care of the rest, yep. and in the end you believe nothing at all, and then you have a false doctrine of literalizing that which is past, and you have the whole question of dispensationalism, literal Israel, Using. and then you're looking for literal wars and situations. And an antichrist in the future. Correct. So let's continue with this, with this saga. So in Daniel 11.40 we read, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, at the king of the north, mm. that is the papacy, 
And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So at the time of the end, 1798, he's going to push at him and he's going to subdue him. Mm -hmm. But that will be overcome and eventually the king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind. That means very rapidly, Martin. Yeah. With chariots and horsemen and many ships, he's going to use the economy. He's even going to use military power. He's going to use everything at his disposal. And he's going to make sure that this king of the south philosophy is set aside because he's allowed it to go so far that it becomes debauched. Yeah. Which is what we see, and we spoke about it in our previous one, not the one before this, but the one before that. Yes. About the setting up of the image of the beast. That's it. And then he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. It's going to be a worldwide rush. Yeah. This and is it's, where it's going to And go. it's also going to be rapid. Yes. Now we had this slide in the previous one. Mm. The one that he is using as a proxy is the beast out of the earth. There are no crowns on any of these horns. The beast has two phases, a lamb-like phase and a phase that speaks like a dragon, right? The dragon is Rome. Yeah. So we want to go back to the king of the north philosophy, that is Roman philosophy. And we want to overcome the secular philosophy that is ruling now. Let's put it this way. In a political sense, the Republicans are going to have to overcome the Democrat way of thinking. That's it. That's where it comes it from. Comes so you have to get rid of woke, you have to bring back mm -hmm. religious uh, ideologies, and then you have to have the church enforce their dogmas because they don't want to sit with this old system That's anymore. That's it. And they can only do that through legislation at this, by the state. Correct. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So it seems like a lamb-like beast, but it will speak like Rome spoke. Mm. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, so he's a proxy. Yeah. And causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he's acting on behalf of the first beast. That's it. Now, nobody in the United States of America will want to believe that. They mm. will say that the Protestant founders, they set up this beautiful system and that Rome had nothing to do with it. Well, we'll have to look at that in a little bit more detail. Because that we saw in the previous one, the freedom of religion was in, brought about by Napoleon. Yes. And liberty, fraternity, mm -hmm. and all of and these tolerance. things. And who sent the Statue of Liberty to the United States? France. France. Mm. Now, in the very year that the first beast received its wound yeah. when the Pope's secular power was taken away. In that very same year, France recognized the sovereignty of the United States of America. Same year. And they sent them the Statue of Liberty. Now that Statue of Liberty is actually a statue of the god Mitra. Yeah. And it's actually, if you go a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. uh, the, the light bearer, which is Lucifer. Lucifer. But uh, let's not go into all of those details. So the proxy is the United States. Now, how did this come about? Is it possible that in the is not stage of the Beast of Revelation 17, he is ruling via a proxy? Mm -hmm. Well, let's reason together about this. Let's have a look at this undercover enemy. Remember that Tapa Sauce said, in his rulers of evil, that the Jesuits were actually in control of American history and nobody knows anything about it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, President Clinton is accredited with saying the worst thing you can do in life is to underestimate your adversary. It's a very dangerous thing. Did the reformers know who the enemy was? Yes, for sure. Did they underestimate him? Yes. It's the same, almost the same, keep your friends close but your enemy closer, that you can study him and know exactly what he's saying. Yes. Now the other thing, I thought I was going to be a bit naughty and put my own quote in there, uh, just as a little bit of a counter, and I thought it would be nice to say the best thing you can do in life 
is to know which side you are on and why. Yeah. In other words, you must study these things, Martin. You can't just know your adversary. You mustn't underestimate your adversary, but you must know why he is the exactly. adversary. And if, he, if you are convinced he is the adversary, you must know which side you are on. And, and you must know why you're on that side. And unfortunately, there's not a state of not deciding which side you're on. If you don't decide the one, you obviously go over to the other. You really are between, what they say, a rock and a hard place. Mm. You have to make a decision here. Pat Shannon, the investigative journalist who wrote the foreword to Tupper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, since says his prosecutor was a Jesuit priest, employed in the Justice Department as an assistant United States attorney, Saucy devoted his fugitive years, ten of them, to studying the extent of Jesuit involvement in the United States government, both presently and historically. I'm, we're putting this slide in to recap what we said before, mm -hmm. just to get us on the same page again. And to do a little bit of um, putting it, everything into perspective. Correct. His labors have rewarded us with valuable new proofs of a vast Roman Catholic substratum to American history that nobody knows about, Martin. Yeah. Evidence suggests that Jesuits played an eminent and underappreciated roles in moving the complacent New Englanders to rebel against their mother country in 1776. So here was a movement to create a new country mm -hmm. with total freedom of religion where no religion could be banned and therefore the Jesuits could operate Freely. unopposed. Mm -hmm. They set up the entire schooling system of the nation. Yeah. Today the presidents are educated at the Fordham and Jesuit universities like um, Georgetown. Georgetown University. All of these things, they are totally in control. Not only that, they have slipped into roles that nobody even knows they're there. They're like snakes in a burrow. Oh, they, and it doesn't matter which side of the uh, political divide, divide. you're on. Like the Jesuit educators of the presidents have said quite plainly that the two political parties are not there to change any policy. Even though they are playing north-south competition, they are actually sitting at the same table plotting these things. That's it. That, well, even the book of the Bible tells us the same. Yes. Now, this same man, Pat Shannon, also wrote that the only people in the world, it seems, who believe in the conspiracy theory of history are those of us who have studied it. So, Martin, that's quite a compliment. Because if you're called a conspiracist, if you're <laughs> called a Bible conspiracist, so much the better. <laughs> now, in Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin, that was a very interesting interview, right? Caused, very interesting. Caused a lot of waves. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the things was that caused a lot of waves is he let Putin speak. Yes. It was clearly alluded that the presidents of the United States are powerless to make decisions. And the real power lies in the intelligence arm of the United States, the CIA. The CIA was founded by the all-powerful intelligence arm of the Roman Catholic Church, run by the Knights of Malta and the Jesuits. That's just common history. Mm -hmm. so let's just listen to that. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing president, Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, Bill, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting. I think so. But in the evening, when we met for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team. No, no, it's not possible now. You can ask him. I think he will watch our interview. He'll confirm it. I repeatedly raised the issue that the United States should not support separatism or terrorism in the North Caucasus. But they continue to do it anyway. 
and political support, information support, financial support, even military support came from the United States and its satellites for terrorist groups in the Caucasus. I once raised this issue with my colleague, also the President of the United States. He says, it's impossible, do you have proof? I said, yes. I said to the FSB director, write to the CIA, what is the result of the conversation with the president? He wrote once, twice, and then we got a reply. We have the answer in the archive. The CIA replied, we have been working with the opposition in Russia, we believe that this is the right thing to do, and we will keep on doing it. Twice you've described US presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. So Martin, he says that the CIA is actually in control. So the Secret Service actually wields a lot of power, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just go back to the book, The Great Controversy and see what it says there. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. Now, Martin, if there is a snare, then Rome must somehow have power that they don't know about, right? Yeah, because it's not visible. Yes. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in churches, in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecution will be repeated. Stealthily, unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends. And when the time comes for her to strike... Now, this must be in the United States. Obviously, she's not building these structures in other countries. No. She's obviously also building them there. Yeah, but, yeah, but here, concerning the United States, this is happening in the United States. This is showing that the proxy, this is she's underground. Underground. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this already is being given her. Mm. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur the reproach and persecution. So we're going to have a conflict. And very clearly it says who the enemy is. It's papacy and Rome. Yes. So here you have a beautiful sunset over the Vatican. But the Vatican doesn't only rule from the Vatican, Martin. Mm. It rules from the very nations that it used to control, yeah. and all the others as well. And like one of the Jesuit generals says, nobody knows how it's done. Yeah. Why even China is subject to them? Why is it that China pays huge sums of money over to the Vatican? Is it to support them, or is it to... Pay a debt. Pay a debt. That it is a, was it a Jesuit that said, from this window I rule? Yes. But it's also interesting that sunset, if you look close, uh, quickly, you can mistake it for the capital. Ah, it looks very, very similar. Yes, the image of the beast. Now, here is a Jesuit uh, structure in Rome. Mm. So it has the symbol of the Jesuits, IHS over there. And on either side, they have these symbols over here. This is the Chiesa of St. Ignazio di Loyola. He was the... The church of Ignatius yeah. of Loyola. And he was the founder of the Jesuit order. Yes, he together with Peter Faber mm -hmm. and Francis Xavier. Mm -hmm. And Francis Xavier is the one who introduced the Inquisition in Goa because there were the Thomasites, Christians that were keeping the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to get rid of that. And Peter Faber was the one who introduced the philosophy. He was the thinker. 
Now, interesting that they make no bones about their feelings about suppressing other churches. Because there they have those two images of it there, or statues, and I've enlarged them, and you can see them standing. The Jesuit order mm. is here crushing the woman underfoot. They are crushing out Protestantism. They're not ashamed of it. No. They are not ashamed of it. They are blatantly advertising it. Let's see what else they advertise. Right next door to this building is the Supreme Council of the Masonic Lodge in Italy. Is that a coincidence? Oh, that must be a complete coincidence <laughs> that it would be right next to the Jesuit enclave. Now, interestingly enough, when you read their plaque over here, they have these three dots in between their letters. And those three dots are a signatory of the Jesuit order. Ah. Whenever a Jesuit signs, he will put those three dots there. And then, of course, they have the double-headed eagle with the 33-degree Masonic sign over there. And this headquarters is right next to the Jesuit seat of power. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's cool. pure coincidence, <laughs> Martin. Pure coincidence. If you enter the churches of the Jesuits, you will immediately see what they are portraying. Here you have the woman with a golden cup in her hand. Mm -hmm. That is Rome. Rome. Popacy. And she's the one that writes the beast according to Revelation. And they are proud of it. And here are the kings of the world with their crowns on their heads, at her feet, adoring her. Mm -hmm. Wondering. Wondering after the beast. But anybody who is not quite in tune is falling away and being eliminated. Yeah. Yeah. You're either with me or you're against me. If you are not with me, I will kill you. Yeah. Right? So you have the kings of the world committing fornication with her. Is that what they're portraying here? Oh, for sure. Here again, you have the depiction of the woman with the golden cup in her hand. Uh, whether this is masculine or feminine doesn't matter because they're very androgenic. Mm -hmm. Very androgenic. And here's another interesting statue that they have over here. Here you have the woman with a lightning bolt. Yeah, in her hand. Now, the lightning bolt was the symbol of Zeus. Mm -hmm. And Zeus was the main god, and he's a symbol of Lucifer, the light bearer. And with the lightning bolt, he gets rid of his enemies. He yeah. strikes them with his lightning, right? He's also the god Thor, mm. god of thunder. And here this woman is using the cross, which has nothing to do with Christianity in this case. This has to do with wielding a power yeah. in the so-called name of Christianity. That's it. But it's actually the Egyptian Ankh, probably, or the Tao. Mm -hmm. And here he is, this woman is obliterating two individuals. And the one is Calvin and the other one is Martin Luther. Mm. So in other words, they're obliterating the Protestant Reformation. They did a good job with that. Oh, for sure. And they, that, that they didn't obliterate, they incorporated. Correct. And then on the other side, you have this little angel, and he's tearing the pages. I've enlarged him here a little bit. There you can see the angel ripping out the pages of this book. That's the writing of Martin Luther. Now, what is the most famous work of Martin Luther? Well, the Bible that he translated. Ah, let's rip it apart, Martin. Mm. Let's use higher criticism and the theory of evolution. And let the Jesuits introduce the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. That Big Bang Theory will explode in their face like a Big Bang at some <laughs> stage. They're going to have their own little mushroom they're going cloud. to have to account for it and go to perdition. Well, uh, I think this is pretty clear what they are trying to portray and what they're trying to say. Here's a little interesting tidbit of history. This is the Museo Nacional Castel Sant'Angelo. Now, this used to be a garrison at some stage, but it also became a, or a fortress, it also became a jail mm -hmm. where high political 
prisoners or religious prisoners were held. Now it has a very, very interesting history. And if you take a little uh, look from another angle, you will see here is this building. And over there in the background is the Vatican. Now, what most people don't necessarily know is that there was a secret uh, connection between the two. Yeah. So you could walk from the one to the other unnoticed. Mm -hmm. So if you were imprisoned here, or supposedly so, imprisoned here, yeah. you could still have contact with whatever was taking place in the Vatican. Now, there was a very famous prisoner in here because when the papacy received a mortal wound mm. in 1798, the Jesuits also received a mortal wound. Or seemingly. Like seemingly <laughs> received a mortal wound. They were banned in almost every country in Europe because of their activities. Mm. And they couldn't operate as freely as they wanted. So, you know, if you are in the, in, the, in the spy world and the heat is on, why not seemingly kill yourself? Best way, just get the heat away from then you. Then it can't be you, right? Yeah. So the Pope can't be the Antichrist, he's dead. Yeah. And the Jesuits can't be the problem, they've been banned, they've okay. been disbanded, they're gone. Yeah. So even the Pope disbanded the Jesuits and the Jesuit general, Ricky, mm. was taken into custody and apparently died in this very, very place. Now, let's read about these things. This comes from the book Real Rulers of Evil. This is Lorenzo Ricci, Society of Jesus General in this very, very interesting time in history. Mm. If the Society of Jesus could conquer though believed dead, could not its superior general do the same? When Lorenzo Ricci died in his cell at Castel Sant'Angelo on November the 24th, 1775, what if his death was no more physical than the supposed disestablishment of his army? Lesser mystics than Ricci who secretly commanded the Rosicrucians, were known to die and resurrect at the threshold of important endeavors. What if it was expedient that the world should think mm. that with General Ricci, the Jesuit order had disappeared? Very, it takes all the attention away. What if it seemed to have a mortal, mortal. wound, but didn't have one? Yeah. And if you take it, what if it, then still is. Ah, what if it know. is not, but actually is still That's, ruling? Yeah. Because the woman is still riding the beast. Mm. And what if the philosophy is the philosophy of the French Revolution? Yeah. The, the, and that is? The destruction of the scriptures. And the, that comes from the bottomless pit. It comes from the bottomless pit. So here we continue with this story. During the fall of 1775, Congress in the United States authorized the committee made up of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Lynch, Benjamin Harrison, and George Washington, Freemasons, all of mm -hmm. them, to consider and recommend a design for the first United Colonial Flag, the so-called Flag Committee. They traveled to Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, according to the only known account of its proceedings, given in Robert Allen Campbell's book, Our Flag, written in 1890, the committee mysteriously shared its authority with a total stranger. This stranger was an elderly European transient known only as the Professor. He had arrived from parts unknown at summer's end. The prisoner of Castel St. Angelo had not been publicly seen in two years, ample time to manage Brashi's election to the papacy, relax, pack important things, die the philosopher's death, and take a three-month voyage to Boston Harbor. Interesting, Martin. If he was banned and he was a prisoner and his whole organization was disbanded, why, when they so-called buried him, mm. 
was he given full honor? Yeah. Shouldn't he have just been buried ignominiously? Yeah, for sure, because the, he was a, a heretic, you can almost oh, say. Oh, he was an evil man. Yeah. Why was he given full honors? Mm -hmm. Very strange. I believe they buried a pile of stones in a coffin. And since his arrival, the professor had occupied a guest room in a private Cambridge home whose hostess, one of his earnest and intelligent disciples, would remember him in a diary cited in Campbell's book as a quiet and very interesting memory of the family. There's a story usually told in conjunction with the professor and the flag committee involving another mysterious stranger, one who suddenly appeared in the legislative chamber of the old state house in Philadelphia on the night of July the 4th. The moment was tense. Independence had been resolved, but the document lacked signatures. Some were having second thoughts about the risks. Masonic historian Manly P. Hall writes, It was a grave moment, and not a few of those present feared that their lives would be the forfeit for their audacity. This is the independence of the United States from Britain. Yes, so their audacity would, is that independence. To declare independence. Mm. In the midst of the debate, a fierce voice rang out. The debater stopped and turned to look upon the stranger. Who was this man who had suddenly appeared in their midst and transfixed them with his oratory? They had never seen him before. None knew when he had entered. But his tall form and pale face filled them with awe. His voice ringing with holy zeal, the stranger stirred them to their very souls. His closing words rang through the building, God has given America to be free. As the stranger sank into a chair exhausted, a wild enthusiasm burst forth. Name after name was placed upon the parchment. The Declaration of Independence was signed. But where was the man who had precipitated the accomplishment of this immortal task? Who had lifted for a moment the veil from the eyes of the assemblage and revealed to them part, at least, of the great purpose for which the new nation was conceived? He had disappeared nor was he ever seen again, or his identity established. So this comes from Manly Palmer Hall, The Secret Teachings. But was this the general? And why is it that the seat of the American government is in Maryland? Yeah. And Maryland belonged to the Jesuits. So the very seat of government is on Jesuit land. That's it. It's interesting, if you go to our own country, South Africa, Parliament. There was an argument the other day why Parliament mm -hmm. should tolerate a Masonic lodge on its ground. And then? And then it was interestingly stated, sorry, it's the other way around. Yeah. Parliament is on the Masonic lodge's ground. Who controls the governments? The Jesuits via the secret societies. So who are these secret societies? Well, this was the general at the time when Benedict ruled. This is Festum. And here are the top knights of Malta. They are, if they become the general, they are also of royal lineage. Okay. They're always royal. Mm -hmm. So they're called his royal highness. Mm. And they are totally subservient to the Pope. Now, the Jesuits, of course, control the Knights of Malta. Yeah. But nobody really knows that because this is the oldest military order that exists in the Roman Catholic Church. So let's just make sure of these issues. Here is an article from 2023. It comes from Vatican News. Pope to order of Malta, go forth in your mission while remaining faithful to Christ. Mm. When you see Christ, substitute the Catholic Church. That's how they, they mean. Means. That's what they mean. So here the Pope visited Malta. Pope Francis addresses the sovereign order of Malta at the conclusion of their general chapter and encourages them, them to go forth in their mission after the election of new high offices while remaining always faithful to Christ. Substitute 
the Roman Catholic Church. That's it. So now he totally reorganized the order. Very interesting. So let's read further in Vatican News. Pope to order of Malta, go forth on your mission while remaining faithful to Christ. He talked about them being sovereign. Mm -hmm. Beginning with the term sovereign, Pope Francis noted that this is a very singular sovereignty. Assumed over the centuries, more than a thousand years in fact, and confirmed by the will of the popes, it allows you to make generous and demanding gestures of solidarity, making yourselves close to those most in need under international diplomatic legal protection. So, you're untouchable. You're untouchable. And they have to be subject to the Pope, yeah. totally subservient to the Pope. Now, this Pope, of course, is a Jesuit, right? Mm -hmm. And then he referred to their military status. So they're entitled to make war. Yeah. Make war on whom, Martin? On the remnant of a seed. Ah, and on Protestantism. That's it. Because he persecuted the woman. That's where it started. So Pope Francis then went on to speak of the word military for the defenses of pilgrims and holy places as well as Christianity papacy. Your order has written glorious pages. Today, those deeds give way to interreligious dialogue. Moreover, faith in Christ and the following of him commit you to the witness of the gospel and to fight against everything that opposes it. Uh, if we can rephrase that, you know what? We've actually beaten the Protestants. Yeah, We've destroyed them. Mm -hmm. So now we are moving into the interreligious dialogue phase. Yeah. We are going to set up a new structure. And you will fight against anything that opposes that because you are obedient to the Pope and to the Church. Yeah. We'll codename that Christ. Hmm? That's exactly what it's saying. That's what he's saying. Now, here's another article from CNA which is the Catholic News Agency. How did Pope Francis change the order of Malta? So he actually, yeah, so he and changed it a bit. Yeah, when? September the 6th, mm. 2022. That's pretty recent, isn't it? Exactly. They must be getting somewhere in their agenda. Um, maybe moving towards a wound that is healed. Ah. The Holy See and the Pope are pervasive. According to Article 6 and 14, the Pope is the co-regulator. All members of the Order of Malta are directly subject to him. That makes it pretty clear. <laughs> so who are they subject to? To the Jesuits. Yes. Because who's the Pope subject to? To the Jesuits. <laughs> to the black Pope. But the he's Jesuit a Jesuit him, and he's a Jesuit himself. And he's a Jesuit himself. So under the old constitution, the members of the order enjoyed a certain autonomy. Uh -huh. So if that was previous... Now they don't. Now nothing. they have to jump. Now, the, this order has a massive budget of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it has, of course, priests and prelates that are in it. But it has a huge secular arm. Exactly. Secular and... And they're all sworn to obedience yeah. to the Pope. Presidents as well. And now, if you belong to this order of Malta, then you are subject to the Pope. Mm. Now, I've shown many slides in the past of presidents in the world, including Nelson Mandela of South Africa, yeah. or his uh, subsequent follower, uh, Dabo Mbeki, or any of the others, they're all involved in these secret societies. What did you have to say about Joe Biden? I've, see, I've read an article that he, in the Jesuit uh, magazine America, that he's also a Knight of Malta. Ah, so if he's a Knight of Malta, is he playing a role? Is he playing it well? Definitely. Isn't well, he playing the role of the King of the South? He's playing the role of the King of the South, but if you go to the other presidents, the skull and bones guys are almost in the same they're all in the same situation yeah. so now you will do exactly what you are told mm. we're in a new era we are moving to the stage when the wound will be healed yeah 
Here's the times of Malta. The new Grand Master of the Order of Malta is sworn in and the date was the 4th of May 2023. So the order has been brought in line with current necessities. Exactly. It's been, you remember that um, Pope Francis also, a few years back, he re-shifted his um, cardinals and everybody and yeah. everywhere he put in Jesuits. Correct. So here is Fra John Dunlop, a 66-year-old Canadian. He's actually a lawyer. And he's been elected prince, remember he's a royal, and 81st Grand Master of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. He is the first professed knight from the Americas to be elected as head of the order. Uh, they must be expecting something important going down. Getting ready for right. the he wound to be completely healed. And he's a Canadian. Now, the Canadians have been very good at playing King of the South philosophy. Mm. And uh, Trudeau has been very instrumental in that. And everybody is riled up against yep. it. And the King of the North philosophy says this can no longer continue, right? So we need a man on the ground. It's almost like the King of the South pushing the King of the North is getting ready to come. No, he's getting against. ready, he's setting up his military strategy. Now, what wonderful work did they do in the past that he referred to? Well, the CIA. Who formed the CIA? It was a Catholic Knight of Malta, William Wild Bill Donovan. He was considered the father of the CIA. He was also the former head of the OSS before he was used to create the CIA. And the CIA is run by the Knights of Malta and other secret society. It is riddled with Freemasonry and secret society, including Knights of the Columba, Columbus and all of this. What about the FBI? Who formed the FBI? It was a powerful Roman Catholic who was also a Knight of Malta <laughs> and a trustee of the Catholic University of America, Charles Joseph Bonaparte. I wonder whether those names are coincidental, Martin. Um, no, I don't think so. So the CIA and the FBI are run by the Knights of Malta to this very day. The Supreme Court has been loaded with mm. Catholic individuals. They are totally in control. Her structures have been set up. She's ready to strike. Exactly. And she's going to use her proxy. Yep. And who is that? United States of United America. United States of America. Now, let's ask a few questions. Could the lamb-like beast be a proxy of the Jesuits? Certainly seems like it. Mm -hmm. One is. That's the six head, because five had fallen, right? Yep. The founding fathers were Freemasons, heavily influenced by the Jesuitical teachings of the French Revolution. A separation of church and state morphing into a secular, socialistic, humanistic form of government represented by the King of the South philosophy. Is that what Napoleon set up? That's for sure. Is that what they transferred to the United States? Yes. Is that what was written into the Constitution in such a way that nobody would notice it? Exactly. And they think that it is Christian. In the meanwhile, it's secularism. Is it written in such a way that they can now reinterpret it? Yes. Hasn't the Speaker of the House said it must be reinterpreted? They did. He said that there's nothing stating that it should be separate. Okay. So, opposed to this philosophy of the South, you have the philosophy of the King of the North, that the papacy wielded throughout the Dark Ages and seek to reinstate in the near future because the wound must heal, right? That's it. When the lamb-like beast start speaking as a dragon mm. and the king of the south philosophy is overrun then the image of the beast will have formed as the seventh head is that correct yes and this will lead to the resurrection of the pope as the eighth head that belongs to the seven because it's one and the same he's ruling them all he said and, and the seven is a proxy it's, j it's still uh, ruled by the woman yes so, five have fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Mm. Babylon was overcome militarily by Medo-Persia, which was overcome militarily by Greece, which was overcome militarily by Rome. 
And since then, mm. there's been no such conquering, but just a change in phase. That's it, a shift. So pagan Rome morphed into Pope. papal Rome. One is fallen Rome ruling through the lamb-like beast in secret societies. Mm -hmm. Not yet come. Lamb-like beast speaking like a dragon. Fortunately, the Bible says, for a little while. Yeah. Because this is the end of the matter. And that's again a movement. Is it fair of God mm -hmm. to say, I will only permit you for a little while? Yes. Why? Because the Reformation made it quite clear who the enemy is. Is it? The Reformation defined why his doctrines were wrong. All of that has been swept under the carpet. A pagan philosophy has been adopted. The heat is off the papacy. Christianity is without an excuse. Yeah. God will see, will you destroy true Christianity? Will you destroy those who love God and keep his commandments? Mm -hmm. I just want to show it to the world that just you quickly. will do exactly that. Yeah. I will permit it for a little while, but I won't let you go all the way. I won't let that happen what happened in the Middle Ages. Yeah. And then there's the eighth beast. That's the resurrected papacy. And it belongs to the seven because it's one and the same thing. The others were just proxies. Yeah, still ruling. The woman also has a head and is thus also the eighth head of the beast. The system goes to perdition. It gets destroyed. Mm. It arises and then gets destroyed. Let's have a look at that. So the number eight stands for a new beginning. Circumcision was on the eighth day. The New Testament connects circumcision with baptism. That's a new beginning, a new life. Correct, yes. In Exodus 22, 29, 30, states that the firstborn was to be given to God on the eighth day. Micah 5, verse 5 says, And this man shall be the peace. When the Assyrian shall come into our land, that was just a type of the Babylonian coming into yeah. the land. And when he shall tread in our palaces... Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. So why seven and eight? Because that's the number of Christ. Yeah, both of it. Both of them. Here's another one, Ecclesiastes 11.2. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. This number eight is a symbol of completeness. Here's another example, 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Samuel went to anoint them, and he went through seven of them, and he yep. said, where's the other one? Well, the youngest is out in the field. Go and fetch him. So he was the eighth. And the man went amongst men for an old man in the days of Saul. But in Chronicles, it says, And Jesse begat the his firstborn, Eliab, and Abinab, and the second, Shema the third, and Nathaniel the fourth, and Meradai the fifth, and Ozan the sixth, and David the seventh. Now what is he? Is he the eighth or is he the seventh? So seven and eight together symbolize, symbolize complete sufficiency. Mm -hmm. In other words, it symbolizes a resurrection to completeness. That and if you are dead in Christ, then you will also be resurrected exactly. or raised in Christ. And that, like you mentioned in that previous one, it's like the seventh day was the rest and the yes. eighth day was the resurrection, the new beginning. Correct. So let's, let's continue this study of Revelation 17. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. There are no crowns on the mm -hmm. head. They are secular powers. But the woman is still... But the woman is controlling, controlling them it. without them knowing it. Through secret societies. Yeah. But they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So for a short while, they will again give the power to the beast, and that means the beast must be resurrected. It will rule again. That will be just before the vials are poured out. Just before the vials are poured out. Revelation 17, 13. 
These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. At the moment, it's not there. It's, but, but it's, it's coming. Oh, it's pushing. We, can, it's we, pushing. Show, we, we showed, showed it that. in that one where we talked about the image of the beast. Mm. These shall make war with the Lamb. How do you make war with the Lamb? By attacking His people and attacking His truth. Mm. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the nations of the world, Martin, are ruled by secret societies. And these secret societies are all subject to Rome. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, that's the way it is. What we see now is a proxy rule. It seems to have a mortal wound. It's... And it first had to destroy the last vestige of Protestantism before it could regain its power. So it also destroyed it by infiltrating and getting it into it with uh, mingling with it. Whether you're talking about Robert Schuller or whether you're talking about any of these, even Billy Graham, they were all Masons. Mm. They were all part of the system. And that's a very sad state of it affairs. Is. But fortunately for the scriptures and unfortunately for this power, there is still a remnant that refuses to acknowledge him. That, that really bugs him. Uh, definitely. <laughs> and that's why he wants this power in order to get rid of them. Let's look. Let's just make sure again about these associations. Remember that mm -hmm. we spoke about them. Fraud runs through all these secret associations and none can be bound up with them and be free men before God and heaven. The moral nature is dragged down to that which God pronounces unjust, which is contrary to his will and his commandments. One who professes to love God may in these associations be placed in positions which are called honorable, but in the eyes of God, he has tarnished his honor as a Christian. And separating father and father from the principles of righteousness and true holiness, he is perverting his powers that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. He is selling his soul for naught. Is that serious? It is so serious because even though you think or it looks to other people, you are doing God's work by associating your there's no blessing. God cannot let you. It's not. If you walk into a Masonic temple and there's an altar mm. and the Quran and the Sanctara Vita and the Bible and the Tanakh and all of them are lying on the table, that is a pagan mishwash. Yeah. Isn't that what we've just read about um, what Napoleon did? Bring all religions on the same level? Can truth and error stand next to each other? No. no. Absolutely not. So in second manuscripts we read, men have confederated to oppose the Lord of hosts. These confederacies will continue until Christ shall leave his place of intercession before the mercy seat and shall put on the garments of vengeance. We're living in that time, Martin. We're, we're this close. Yeah, for sure. Satanic agencies are in how many cities? <laughs> Every city. Every city. Busily organizing into parties that oppose to the law of God. Professed saints and avowed unbelievers take their stand with these parties. This is no time for the people of God to be weaklings. We cannot afford to be off our God for a moment. Get out of ecumenical Get stuff. Out. You cannot negotiate with this enemy. Not at this stage in history especially. No. So how's this going to pan out? Mm. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Martin, they were just of one mind. Yeah, they, they just gave all their power and were wandering after it. They were wandering after it. They gave it all its power. And now all of a sudden, they hate the whore. Mm. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now it's very interesting because the punishment for a whore or a prostitute yeah. was stoning. Mm, mm. Unless she was the daughter of a priest, yeah. then she was burnt. burnt. 
Now this whore is going to be burnt, so yeah. she must assume priestly power, right? Mm. This is the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And the kings of the world will hate her. What changes their mind, Martin? They see that it's, it's lost, that they hope cause. The whole of Revelation 17, who told the story? Wasn't it an angel with a vial in his hand? Ready to pour it. Weren't those the plagues? Yeah. And here they were thinking that they were doing the bidding of a godly thing, and all of a sudden they're hit by plagues. Yeah. One plague, two plagues, three plagues, four plagues, five plagues. Nightmare. Six plagues, and they realize we're lost. We've yeah. been duped. And their anger and their animosity rises, and they hate the whore. And in every nation, they will attack her. Isn't she a universal church? Yeah. They will burn her with fire. They're going to destroy her churches. They're going to rip them down. They will rip them apart with their bare hands if they can. But because they are eternally lost. It's too late. It's too late. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his will, his permissive will, mm -hmm. and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. They're going to give them their power. This is now before yes. they turn against it. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And who is this woman? She is that great city that reigneth over the kings of the earth. She's called... Babylon, yeah. but she sits on a Roman beast. That's it. It's a very sad story, Martin. This is the most serious story, and it's actually amazing how you can see this, sh this move of it being fulfilled. Yes. Now, Martin, the Bible says what has been has been before. It's always been there in type. We are now living in the anti-type. Yeah. So if we go to the book of Isaiah, where it warns against uh, literal Babylon, it's a type of what happens to spiritual Babylon. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne. Mm. A throne is going to be removed. O daughter of the Chaldeans, who are the modern-day Chaldeans? The Jesuits. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And then from verse 11, Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. Mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, mm -hmm. and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon you. She's going to be destroyed. Completely. Completely and utterly. And this is exactly what's going to happen to this system. Behold, there shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. Isn't that what happens to her? Yes. She is burnt with fire. Ashes. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his court, and none shall save thee. Through her secret societies, through her so-called philanthropic multi-billionaires, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. she controls the entire economy. Yeah. She owns the banks of the world, the banking system, the Rothschilds, the Bank of America. She is the one that calls the shots. The militaries. And Revelation 18 tells us the same thing. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she says in her heart, I sit a queen. I am not a widow. I shall see no sorrow. So she's very boastful. Very boastful. Did we see those statues? Oh, yeah. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death 
and mourning and famine. Can you see that it's plagues? Yeah. Yes. And she shall be utterly burnt with fire. Same story. Strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. They are permitted to live a little longer and then they are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Doesn't Psalms 110 say that he will destroy kings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when he comes? He will fill the places with dead bodies. Yeah. Martin, there's a terrible judgment coming. That's it. Terrible. And, uh, so you can decide. You still have a choice now. You still have a choice. So let's wrap this up. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. And the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. That's what's going to happen. And that's it. And this, okay, we might just say, can be done by either the, the Republicans or the Democrats. Can be done. To me, logically, the Republican side seems logical. Mm -hmm. But history will be fulfilled and prophecy will be fulfilled with or without them, That's even it. if the stones have to do it. Because the only thing that really has to happen, they have to go, they have to do the bidding of Rome. So yeah. who it does, doesn't matter. That correct. All right, here's another quote from Five Testimonies. When our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact the Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. It will be nothing else than giving life to the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again into active despotism. So something's going to happen. It's another statement from the great controversy. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Is that clear? It's clear. And as we read this, I get the pictures that we showed in two episodes again, uh, ago. Yes. It's happening. It's happening. Here's an article from the Review and Herald. Many will plead that there is no prospect that popery will ever be revived. If it shall regain its lost ascendancy, it will be by Protestantism giving it the right hand of fellowship. So the beast out of the earth is actually responsible for the resurrection of the first beast. Yes. But the first beast is actually controlling the politics of the beast out of the earth. Uh, yes. It's like because the woman rides the beast. That's it. It's a perfect proxy. It shall be legislated into power by the concessions of time-serving men. Mm. Oh. Mm. They don't know what's going on. They go with the flow. The fires of persecution will be rekindled against those who will not sacrifice conscience and the truth for the errors of papacy. Once let the minds of the Christian world be turned away from God, let his law be dishonored and his holy day trampled upon and they will be ready to take any step where Satan may lead the way. So Martin, we showed in our previous one, or one of the previous ones, that Trump promises a revival of Christian power in speech to national religious broadcasters. If I get in, you're going to be using that power at a level you never used it before. Is that the church dictating to the state? For sure. Trump told the annual gathering of national religious broadcasters at Nashville's Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. He told the religious broadcasters 
that one of his first acts of a second Trump term would be to set up a task force to root out anti-Christian bias. Root it out. That is, is that speaking like a dragon? Oh, <laughs> perfectly. I will be a peacemaker. Ah, that's how you can twist it. That's it. And I will be the only president who can say, and I say this with great conviction, I will prevent World War III. In actual fact, he said that he will reverse the border crisis mm -hmm. and get rid of the murderers that are killing the young women in the United States. He will re... Uh, connect the economy so that uh, inflation is turned around. He will prevent World War III. Mm -hmm. And he will reinstate the church. Through, le we, sorry, through legislation? Through legislation. We have to bring back our religion, he said. We have to bring back Christianity. Uh, that's creating the image to the beast. Now, though she leads the United States, this is going to happen everywhere, right? Yes. Is the world getting ready for it to happen? It anywhere? is. Well, it's very interesting if you take these statements that you just made and you take the spirit of prophecy statement, how it's fulfilling. It's dovetailing. And then, of course, 2025 and this nationalism project and how many right-wing organizations have signed this project 2025 and how they're going to bring it in. Under the heading Big Picture, the manifesto claims to affirm that this Christian nationalist project entails national recognition of essential Christian orthodoxy. That's enforcing dogmas. Just like Pope Rome did in the Middle Ages. So yes. persecution will be rekindled. As a Christian consensus under Jesus Christ, the supreme Lord and King of all creation. No, under the papacy. Yeah, and we f forget that Christians were persecuted under the Christian papal rule. Yes. And the establishment of general equity of the Ten Commandments as the foundational law of the nation. No, papal Ten Commandments. Yeah. That means Sunday law and not Seventh day Sabbath. The whole thing is there. This is not fooling around. This no. is very serious. Now, what about the rest of the world? Here's an article. And it's brand new. Hungary's Auburn vows search to the right in US and Europe. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has told a crowd of cheering supporters that his government's nationalist conservative policies will win this year in Europe and beyond. Mm -hmm. We started this year alone. By the end of it, we will be the majority in the world, he said in Budapest. He was confident Donald Trump would win November's US presidential election and right-wing parties would win European Parliament elections in June. Man. Is the world ready for this? Oh, for sure. And Putin is a friend of this guy. And so, yes, Putin is the friend of this man. Here we go, Martin. The stage is set. So where does that leave us? When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands. Did we just see that? Right across the world. A simultaneous movement. Are we seeing that? Oh, yeah. For their destruction. That's interesting. At the time appointed, in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which shall utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. That sounds like a Bartholomew night. Yeah. And like in France, when they said, in one night we will destroy the Protestants. And what did Rome do? They rang the bells and were overjoyed that the Protestants had been slaughtered and murdered. Yeah. So it was Christian killing Christian. And who's the enemy? Revelation 14 verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They are rooted in what Jesus says in his word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my mm -hmm. path. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And Martin, they keep the commandments of God and refuse 
to adhere to the commandments of the Pope. Yeah. And they will be the enemy. Because this will be the last attempt of Satan to rid the world of any opposition to his rule. And God will permit it to a point. Just a short time. But for a short time. Just to demonstrate that rebellion is incurable. But for, don't think for a moment it's not going to be a fierce time. It's going to be a fierce battle and we are just before it. Revelation 17 has almost reached its culmination. And I believe it can reach it within months, maybe a year. It's interesting that Donald Trump said it will be decided on November the 5th. Mm. Now, isn't November the 5th Guy Fox Day? Yeah. What happened that Guy Fox, Martin? The, they tried to get rid, uh, blow up the parliament to get rid of the King James Bible. Ah, to get rid of the Bible and Protestant rule. Mm. And are they going to blow up the parliament in an antitypical fashion on November the 5th yeah. and set up papal supremacy again and resurrect? The eighth. I think it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I think we're heading for it. I Let's do. pray that the Lord preserves us. Amen. Let's bring a loud cry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a story, all depicted there in the Bible. And we are reading it now in the pages of history and seeing the culmination thereof. And multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Who's going to reach them? Who's going to tell them? Who's going to warn them? If the loud cry does not go out, humanity will not know and run over the precipice. Help us to give them a choice so that at least some turn from the precipice. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please note that WhatsApp Prof will be back next week due to attendance at a camp meeting in Namibia. Enjoy some of the footage of Namibia and the camp. See you again next week. Mm -hmm.